Hey, it's me, Chance, with Punk Journalism. So I recorded this conversation with Professor Carlson months ago, and my busy schedule dictated that I wouldn't be able to get around to releasing it until now. But due to the uh, regularity of mass shootings in the U.S., unfortunately, this is always a timely topic. Especially timely since just a few weeks ago, there were two mass shootings in one day, one in El Paso, Texas, the other in Dayton, Ohio. Professor Carlson's work examines gun politics, policing, and public law enforcement, the politics of race and gender, and violence. Her book on the politics of gun carry, Citizen Protectors, the Everyday Politics of Guns in an Age of Decline, draws on in-depth interviews and participant observation at firearms classes, activist events, shooting ranges, and online gun forums. The book examines the growing popularity of gun carry among American men, which is what our discussion will largely entail. Her current project examines gun law enforcement in Arizona, California, and Michigan through interviews with police chiefs and observation of gun licensing procedures. In addition to her academic work, she's written for popular audiences and venues such as the Detroit News, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. Lastly, I just want to remind you where you can find me, punk-journalism.com, facebook.com, slash punk-journalism, instagram.com, slash punk-journalism, uh, where you can stay up to date with everything that I'm working on. All right, so Dr. Carlson, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing all right as well. So before we get into the conversation, I just want to get a little bit of background into your research and sure. specifically one of the books that you had written, uh, Citizen Protectors, The Everyday Politics of Guns in an Age of Decline. This was published in 2015. Yeah. Um, from your bio, it says it draws on in-depth interviews and participant observation at firearms classes, activist events, shooting ranges, and online gun forums. The book examines growing popularity of gun carry among American American men. So in that book and the research that you did, what what did you find at the individual level to be people's main motivation for guns? Okay, so um, yeah, so my research, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, involves uh, looking at why Americans uh, carry guns. Uh, and so, you know, in the at the simplest level, um, what I found was actually what has already been shown in um, Pew and Gallup uh, poll after Pew and Gallup poll, which is that the primary reason that um, Americans are not just owning but also carrying guns is for personal protection. So that's a huge shift. Um, it used to be the case that the number one reason why uh, people in the U.S. own guns was for hunting, um, but that is that's no longer the case. And you can see that, um, yeah, with with why how Americans talk about their guns, um, what guns they're purchasing. Um, handguns um, obviously are, are much more of a self-defense weapon than, say, um, you know, a shotgun. Um, and um, uh, and how gun manufacturers are, are marketing guns as defensive tools. So what do you think has caused the shift in, in culture to cause this? Because you said that it used to be uh, primarily for hunting and now it's for, for home protection. And and I always kind of I, I like to look at like timelines as far as when these sort of things happen and, and look for things to correlate them with as far as like maybe so, the political atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And what I always kind of come back to and I cite this a lot is a lot of issues that I see in, in our culture is I wonder sometimes if it may be that we're living in an age of paranoia, especially with like the per this the this being perpetuated by an oversaturation oversaturation of news and information and uh news or quote unquote news being given to us as a means of you know over sensationalizing and exacerbating kind of uh fears in people just to sell content and for good ratings and i mean do you think that that correlates to that at all? Does yeah. that have anything to do with it? Yeah, that? how much that has to do with it. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I really love, you know, digging deep into, um, you know, like, uh, you know, the 18, early 1800s in the U.S. or, you know, different historical moments because you see very clearly that what we think of, you know, even the fake news epidemic, uh, 
you know, whatever you think about that, um, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, so I think that's something to remember, remember that, um, you know, paranoia, conspiracy theories, uh, you know, fake news, all of these things are actually uh, dynamics that, that you can see throughout U.S. history. Um, and the real question is, like, is the U.S. similar to other countries or is this, is this you know, is this just how human societies work? Um, and that's that's obviously a whole other <laughs> can of worms to open up. I would say, though, that you're absolutely right, though, that there is a way in which um, fear does matter. So in thinking about, um, you know, the the sort of rise of what people call gun rights 2.0, which is a concealed carry oriented, defensive oriented um, gun culture, as opposed to more hunting and leisure uh, gun culture, gun culture 1.0. Um, and so there's a couple. Of, so first of all, the the timeline in that shifting um, is actually uh, goes back a little farther. And I would actually say that the shift, you start to see the shift um, starting in the 19, 1960s and 1970s. That's really the the um, beginning of this this shift. Um, part of it is you know the rise of the new right. Um, part of it is, and so that's like a transformation in in um, what American uh, conservatism. You even looks like and what they do and how they mobilize. Um, part of it is um, the war on crime is a huge piece of this puzzle. And so it's super fascinating to go back to the 1960s and read newspaper reports of um, gun violence. So gun violence was happening. Actually, guns and bombs were a huge issue. A lot of people forget that bombings were actually quite common in the late 60s and early 70s um, in the U.S. because we don't have a bomb lobby. We think a lot about guns. But even the so-called gun lobby in the 1960s, it, um, it you can tell that both sides didn't really know how to make sense of all of it, right? Um, so the NRA that we know today really would not um, cohere until the late 1970s. And so you have sort of um, you know, this emerge. there's a lot of problems that suddenly emerge, uh, you know, into the national consciousness in, in the 1950s and 1960s, and gun violence is one of them, and the problem of crime is one of them. Um, and so you see sort of the rhetoric of fear, you see um, particular, uh, you know, tough on crime uh, discourse about what the government and what the state should do. And interestingly enough, um, you know, we think about mass incarceration as this, you know, this this bloated state apparatus, um, which we can see the data of that, you know, that, that, starting, you know, in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, but the other piece of that is that there was a great degree of um, fear, of anxiety about whether the state could actually, even, even with all of the resources behind it, address the problem of, of crime. Um, and so that's where um, security commodities, everything from home alarm systems, com you know, you, if you look at, you know, movies from the 1970s in New York, you see, you know, uh, like crazy locks on people's doors. I mean, there's just like, a, there was a whole kind of emergence of, of personal security devices and guns were one of those and so that's where you know guns as so this idea of guns as a way to deal with concerns about crime um, you know that's actually that that's decades in the making now the question that you should probably be asking me next is um, okay so so we're we're afraid of crime, but what are we actually afraid of when we say that um, we're afraid of crime? Um, and that's that's also what I get into my book. And that has to do a lot with actually thinking about um, not just criminal insecurity, but also kind of a more general uh, insecurity, insecurity about um, jobs, about um, public services, about, um, you know, and, and a lot of this is wrapped up in the, the collapse of the manufacturing industry. Okay. Yeah. So in when we talk about like the differences between the 50s and the 60s and 70s uh, up until mm -hmm. today, that kind of makes me think about a book that I read in grad school that was called Bowling Alone. I don't know if you're familiar with it by, uh -huh. by Robert Putnam. Yeah. And one of the uh -huh. big, the kind of the driving premise of that book is that, you know, it's called Bowling Alone because in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there were bowling leagues and that was like a big thing and, and not that's not really something that you hear of anymore and people kind of, they, they yeah. don't participate in that because they would rather just kind of isolate themselves in their home with their family because they're afraid of, there seems to be this fear of the other and, and being afraid of, you know, co-mingling with people in society and that may be being rooted in, you know, the rise of 24 hour news again. And so I wonder when you say that about like us being afraid of or being insecure about things that we're not so much insecure about now, maybe it was kind of like we were insecure about Cold War fears at that time. You're talking about like bombs and home security. 
Um, and it, I, since that's no, you know, that fear went away, like our fear had to shift to something more localized. And I wonder if sometimes we become so comfortable in our lives as a culture that we almost have to find something to create conflict or something to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, actually, if you look in the 1950s, um, just because you mentioned the Cold War and, you know, there's there's some really fascinating parallels to draw between, you know, fear and anxiety over the Cold War and fear and anxiety as it plays out now, for example, with, um, you know, active shooting drills in schools and that sort of thing. Um, And one thing, um, you know, I think the Cold War is actually a really interesting piece of the puzzle in explaining why gun culture transformed um, because the 1950s is of course the era of you know ca- the, the the what's been called the cowboy craze right every kid wants a toy revolver you have you know all the movies kind of celebrating the wild west and all that and um, a big part of that was um, co- you know kind of dealing with cold war anxieties and in some ways you know seeing guns as well this is a way this is a way to build up the the masculine and democratic mm, right. character of boys um, and so by the time we get to the 1970s, though, those threats really, I mean, not that the Cold War isn't on the minds of people, um, but suddenly it's the Black Panthers, it's Black Power Groups, it's the weather underground. And so that's where it's, it's internal threats that are also um, being kind of activated by this this um, culture of fear. Um, so that's depth. And so I think that by the time you get there, that's where then you you shift to this much more. So, so there's that. So you can think about guns as, as an oriented toward a national security project um, and like a a military national security is it oriented toward leisure and hunting or is it oriented toward this kind of individualistic policing project um, which is what I'd say we have you know what we have now even though the other two don't go away but they're they're less dominant Um, but yeah that what what was your question though you had an (laughs) so I was basically I guess what I was kind of driving at is no matter how comfortable we get as a society are we always I mean, is, are we almost uncomfortable with the sense of being too comfortable? And so we have to find some sort of something to make us feel like we need to protect our interests or, or be on edge. And there's somebody that's going to come get us. So we need to arm up. And uh, that's kind of just been my, my perception is just that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, so there's, there's, it depends on what perspective you're looking from. But I think that, you know, if we look at the history of the US, um, how it was founded um, violently on, you know, the basis of, uh, you know, clearing lands of Native Americans and in, engaging in, you know, physical and cultural genocide. If we look at the institution of slavery and the, you know, all of the fall of fall out of that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I definitely think there's been moments like the, you know, the, what do they call them? The roaring nineties where, um, you know, everything seems like it's going to be fine. <laughs> um, but generally I think we've actually, we have a pretty insecure society, especially if we can, you know, compare it to, um, you know, Scandinavian countries, um, that have, you know, strong welfare states, um, don't have, um, the same levels of racial inequality that we have, um, so there's so so I would actually question the premise of if we're actually as comfortable as as maybe we think we are, we're, and we're definitely more unequal now as well. So that's definitely rates of, of inequality. More um, more unequal now as far as class class. class. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so that that also will create further tensions, of course. So um, and so I want to get to um. A few, one of your main areas of research, it seems, is is uh, male or masculinity as it relates to gun violence. And I I wrote a blog a, a while back about this issue, and I I actually quoted you from a USA Today article where you said, "It isn't easy to be a man in the United States. Demands are put on men, whether it's to be a protector, to be a provider, to respond to situation in certain ways, to prove yourself as a man." you end up being not just outwardly destructive, but also inwardly destructive. So we it, it's no secret that the vast majority, if not nearly all mass shootings that take place, I almost want to say in the U.S., but unfortunately we saw the incident last month in New Zealand, mm-hmm. was outside of the U.S. This almost is exclusively a male issue. And what do you, I know this is a big question, but what do you think is as far like, what are the societal issues that are that are causing young men and you know it seems to be a lot of young men 
to do this sort of behavior, to, to react in this way. I'm going to answer the question of what what do what does masculinity have to do with gun violence? Sure. Is that yeah. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I I so so it's interesting because I think that a lot of times when people debate guns and gun violence and they turn to explanations about masculinity and gender. Um, which is a really complicated thing because there's many ways to be a man in society and where people get their ideas about who they are as, you know, as, as their gender identities, um, whatever those identities may be, are super complicated and, and not simple. But somehow when we talk about gun violence and masculinity, it always seems to simplify the debate. Um, so my, um, you know, my research is obviously really focused on men. Um, part of that is because men are, you know, if you, if you want to know one indicator as to why, whether someone owns a gun, you want to ask them, are, are, do you identify as a man? And then that's the, that's the, the key predictor. Um, it, are you a married man? Are you a Southern man? You know, there's others, but, but Matt, whether you identify as a man is, is a key one. Um, um, so here's the way I think about this, which is that, um, it, and this is what I really get to in my book. So I, I think, you know, if we look at, um, let's look at um, uh, life expectancy. Life expectancy in the U.S. has gone down, and a lot of that is a result of men coping with alcohol, with opioids. Um, we see a we see suicides going up we see um we see a lot of um what is coping but it's very ultimately still self-destructive coping okay. um when i see that i don't see so and and by the way i would say the same thing about a lot of gun violence that happens um you know if you look at um there's a wonderful documentary called the interrupters which is about gun violence um and a group that um works on basically de-escalating gun violence in the context of chicago um sort of in the epicenter of, you know, the gun crisis in Chicago. Um, and what you really get, whether you read about sort of gun violence, uh, people turning to guns in the context of suicide, um, whether it's, um, you know, in the context of, of gun violence in Chicago, you see that it's a lot of this is really people, people trying to cope um, and, and clearly not coping in any, any socially productive way. Um, and so I think that there is a tendency when, you know, and, and I know you'll probably ask about toxic masculinity, and I actually don't like using that term because I think it, it, it actually reproduces the very culture that we're trying, that we should be trying to stop when we talk about that. It's, term, kind, of a, that, it's kind of an insult, I guess, right? It, yeah, it's an insult, and it basically says you're you're messed up. It's your fault, and you need to suck it up and fix yourself. Which is exactly what we say is wrong with masculinity, right? Like that's right, exactly yeah. what when when we ignore that we have created, um, you know, and and this really varies across race, um, definitely across class, um, but we have created a a we we are all participating whether willingly or unwillingly or whatever in a culture that sets certain standards for men and then does not have the structural conditions of, of men actually being able to reach, you know, reach those standards. Um, and I think that that is, I mean, that's a much bigger problem than just, Hey, stop, stop, you know, stop acting. <laughs> stop acting. Right. Yeah. Masculinity. And I think that, you know, I don't want to say, um, I don't want to say, you know, this isn't to say like, oh, everything's just coping and whatever. Um, people do bad things, um, but we can do a lot more to to give assistance to people on the on the path to, you know, what they're doing to try and pull them into, um, you know, into into a, a better way of being. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways economically in terms of mental health. And I don't mean mental health as like we need to stigmatize people with mental health issues because actually people who have um, mental health issues are much more likely to be victimized than perpetrators of gun violence. Um, but, you know, it's 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 not a surprise that when, um, you know, the commission in the aftermath of Parkland tried to figure out what what went wrong um there was a lot that went wrong and you know it it was guns it was um a lack of of social supports it was the criminal justice system not actually following up on tips that could have been followed up to to stop this so um yeah i mean there's a lot there's a lot of dysfunction and so to say it's about masculinity um is illuminating and really helpful as long as you trace it through and actually think through what does it actually mean when i say this is about masculinity yeah, yeah. so and I think 
it's also pretty pretty I, at least to this date it's pretty well i think understood and recognized that that it's not very socially acceptable for men to to express any sort of emotion other than anger mm-hmm. um yeah. and huh? i came across a uh an article from the American Psychological Association that said that men are less likely than women to seek mental health for depression, substance abuse, and, and stress. And par- yeah. parallel to this, men are also three times more likely than women to own a gun. And this was from a Pew Research Center mm-hmm. study. So- yeah, and men, and can I add one other stat to that? Men are also much less likely to have uh, close friendships really? okay. um, later in life as women. Yeah, which is also when you think about, like, even if you don't go to a counselor, do you have someone that you can talk to about what matters most to you? Um, and there's some great research that shows that that men's friendships, part of the coming of age sort of, um, you know, part of coming of age for, for boys, boys into men in, in American society is, is, is kind of giving up on those deep friendships, which is just, it's, it's devastating and it's sad and it's, it's, it has nothing to do with, you know, it's not, it's so beyond politics. It's just, it's just, it's sad. So what do you, what would you recommend then we could do at an individual level or a cultural level to, to kind of break these stigmas? And because it seems like the, the, a big step in the right direction is for allowing young men to be able to express themselves in a more, in a healthier, more constructive way. What do you think the steps that need to be taken to, to accomplish this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we can always, we can, we can think on multiple levels, right? Like we can think about how do we institutionalize, um, and, and normalize through our social institutions, um, people expressing a full amount of emotion, um, or a full, sorry, not a full amount, a full range of emotion. Um, I think that, I mean, it's, it's in a way it's such a simple, you know, when we think about how social media has, has in many ways pulverize our connection to one another. Um, when we think about how we walk around with our heads buried in our phones, we don't interact with our families in the same ways, maybe because of social media, maybe because we've decided that we have to write up, you know, half of our families because of politics. I mean, whatever. Um, you know, this is actually something where I, I actually think that and, and and as a sociologist, generally sociologists do not like to, to say, well, change starts with the individual. Um, but I actually think this is a place where if individuals aren't changing their own engagement and aren't modeling, um, you know, openness to to that it's okay that men cry, that it's okay that we acknowledge that things are difficult and traumatic and what have you, um, that we, we can't hope to change the, the bigger picture. And that's what I find really difficult about, um, you know, going back to the gun debate is that the, the gun debate, you know, we can say like, okay, this is, this is an acrimonious debate and we're, we're, we're angry and we're, you know, and so therefore this is going to be a deadlock lock political thing and we're never going to pass any, any laws. Okay. So fine. That's definitely a fallout of, you know, angrily debating, you know, guns as a, as a zero sum game, but it also erodes us as people because a lot of what we carry to the gun debate is, is dealing either with trauma that we have experienced or trauma that we're afraid of experiencing. And that's something that I definitely found with, you you know, the gun, the, the gun carriers. Um, and, and this is something that I, you know, I always stand by, which is that, you know, they express it differently. They obviously are socially situated differently, but at the end of the day, you know, many gun control and gun rights advocates are concerned with the same thing, which is a, which is a basis, basic sense of security and safety that they don't feel they have. Um, and I, I think that that is, if that was the orientation for how we talked about guns, we'd have a fundamentally different debate. So, one thing also that uh, that I've always been curious about is we saw a big shift post Columbine, where leading up to that, we we didn't really see mass shootings, especially school shootings, and especially young people like that that were that were um, having those sort of outbursts. And what do you think leading up to that? You know, up into the I think that was 1998 when that happened. What was the was it 99? Okay, what had occurred? What, what what was the shift? What was the breaking point that from Columbine onward, this seemed to be an unfortunate, almost regular occurrence? Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that in, in kind of answering the, the, that question is, um, 
uh, something to note is that the Columbine shooters were never intending for them to be known as as school shooters. They um, set up bombs, and they the bombs would have been much more destructive than the guns. Um, but the bombs didn't detonate, so then they turned to the guns. Um, so the reason that's kind of, I guess, interesting is that I think, and, and this is something that, you know, I, there's there's definitely questions of sort of how we talk about guns, um, you know, with changes in gun culture, changes in mask, you know, we can get into all that. But a very kind of simple explanation, and you can see this in the manifestos of school shooters and, and mass shooters, is that... Um, Columbine provided a script. Um, it provided this kind of, and this is where the whole debate on like, do you name the the killers? How much do you publicize them? Right, How do yeah. we talk about victims or killers? Because you know, even with the the um, the woman who who actually, um, I I think as of as of now, I, I believe the news reports is that she killed her. She committed. She completed suicide. Mm. Um, but um, she you know left Florida. I think to actually travel to Columbine yeah. for the twentieth anniversary of yeah and so she was like kind of obsessed with the event um so i actually think that columbine itself is um it is one of the the you know that that now this is this is this kind of you know event that um you know is inspiring copycats so i think that's that's something that shouldn't be underestimated even though it seems like such a simple sort of explanation so you think columbine itself was the catalyst for what we've seen since then I mean, yeah, and you can see that, and, and that's not, again, I'm not discounting other factors as well, but if you want to look at, like, what happened after Columbine, um, school shooters, you know, either by virtue of their media, their social media consumption and their internet consumption, or what they're actually writing in their manifestos, are are seeing what they do as a way to act out Columbine. Okay. All right. So, in... <clears throat> Also, I, I remember around that time, because I was like 14 or 15 when it happened, and I remember folks that were in my parents' age group, They, the scapegoat was for video games and music, specifically Marilyn Manson. And from what I, I've understood later on is that video games aren't a, uh, they're not, they don't, they don't necessarily uh, steer people in the direction of violent behavior unless you're already predisp- predisposed to a, a tendency mm-hmm. for violence. So, I mean, yep. do you see those types of medias as as problematic, or are they just simply scapegoats? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's difficult to say because, and, and this is why it's hard, is that, so what you're basically doing is, and, and part of, Part of my answer to this question, um, I, I don't think I would answer this question in quite the same way had I not lived in um, Canada for a few years, which was really illuminating because, you know, obviously there's <laughs> there's the obvious stuff that's different between the U.S. and Canada. Um, but, you know, kind of in the stereotypic, uh, you know, Europe, Europe is, uh, you know, we the U.S. loves violence and Europe loves sex. And you can see it in how we, you know, how, how our media is, how our ads are. <laughs> I've never thought of it that way. Um, you know, and so, you, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's like kind of the stereotype. And so you see, you see very different cultures. And so I think what's so, so yes, that is true that it's been very difficult to scientifically nail out a relationship between consumption of violent video games and, um, and, uh, you know, acts of violence, partly because there's a selection effect, there's, you know, there's, it's, it's difficult. And there's a lot of things going on in mediating that, that causal relationship. But the other difficult part is that we live in a society that is already, pretty saturated with violence so when we look at you know when we look at film when we look at news coverage when we look at just the rates of violence when we look at the fact that kids are going through active shooter drills and so they're being told from a very young age violence happens and you shouldn't be surprised if it happens in your school because and that's why we're that's why we're doing this drill um i think so that so that's what i think actually the big critique of of trying to figure out that link is that you can't you're 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 already in you know like you're you that that link is very hard to kind of stamp out when you're already in a society that's that's um you know where like I live in Arizona and um you know I can assume that someone is armed every time I go out into public um because there are just there are guns everywhere um and that's that's just a presumption of you know what what life is like and you can love it you can hate it but um 
yeah. So I think that's where sort of it's a, it's a much bigger cultural thing than just um, and it's always been that way. Like we can look through history and and the ways in which guns have mattered um, haven't been just sort of incidental or um, you know isolated in, in American yeah, history. Yeah, well, and you're you're spot on with that is because it from what I've researched anyway that there are more guns than there are people in the U.S. and it's. <laughs> We don't actually know, but we think, yeah, we don't, we don't actually know how many guns there are, but it seems like there are more. Than right. And it, that, that yeah. The number yeah. is, is just going up. And I wonder sometimes, is it a cultural backlash? Uh, because you have part of the, the culture that attempts to raise awareness about issues of gun violence and just try to have the discussion of should, you know, more regulation be put in place. And almost by default, another part of the culture is very reactive and pushes back by countering that movement by doing the opposite. And I wonder in this case, becoming over more overly obsessed with guns. And I, I wonder sometimes if like that reactionary sort of statement yeah. of, well, this yeah. group of people says, you know, we should have more gun regulation. They're trying to take away my guns. So I'm going to go buy more guns is almost yeah. kind of like yeah. contributing as well to, to the culture that we yeah, I mean, I definitely think so. One example um, that just happened. So in California, um, there's obviously a lot more regulation, a lot more regulations in California than in Arizona, um, and you know, it's 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 a high, it's highly regulated. And so one of the unusual laws that they have compared to the other fifty states is um, a ban on high. You know, high capacity magazines. So magazines that that hold more than ten rounds, um, and so that has long. So so there's been kind of a back and forth on like it, you know on, on sort of tweaking that law over the past couple of years, and um, basically for a week. And I think it was it was was it last week or the week before? It won't matter because I guess it'll be when <laughs> it, it will be a week in April when this uh, podcast uh, comes out. Anyway, so for a a week, um, basically by virtue of a a federal judge um, basically putting a stay on that law. It was it was legal for Californians to buy these these round magazines that, that had more than 10 rounds. And so, I mean, it was if you look at the reports, it, it looks like hundreds of thousands, if not over a million of these magazines are now in California by virtue of this one week freeze on this law. Um, and now what's okay, so what's going on? Part of it, I think, is definitely people who are like, I can buy it now. And so I bet, you know, it's a fear of lost opportunity. If I don't buy it now, I'm not going to get it. Um, I'm not, I, you know, it's going to it's going to be um, outlawed again. Um, but I think part of it also is just kind of um, I think there's there's kind of a thrill in thumbing your nose up to the liberal establishment in California. And I think that there's a lot of. Um, there's, and this is where I think the gun control side ha still has a lot of catch up to do, which is that gun laws are really complicated. And I think that, you know, there's nothing, maybe there's a few things, but, <laughs> but, but gun rights advocates really love pointing out the, the, um, idiosyncrasies and loopholes that are, are built into poorly made gun laws. Um, and, and so I think that's something, I think it's, I think you're definitely right that there's sort of a like, oh, you know, I beat the system kind of thing going on. Um, in addition to this like fear of, um, you know, if, if I don't buy it now, I'm never going to get it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a complicated, you know, there's it's complicated politics. Yeah. Well, and almost immediately following the tragedy in New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand uh, immediately put a, a ban on semi-automatic and automa automatic weapons, and of course, she didn't have to go through as many uh, as many um, sort of uh, bureaucratic uh, what's the word I'm looking for like firewalls that that, mm -hmm. that we would have to go through in the U.S. with con Congress and Senate and so forth. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, do you think that that was an appropriate response? Do you think it was a knee-jerk reaction? I mean, I, I think that, I mean, this is where I very strongly believe that people, you know, by virtue of being in a democracy, people <laughs> get to decide what their what their politics are. So I would say that you know this that's up to the people of New Zealand. Um, that's not um, you know I and I, I think that's maybe where I'm different uh, than you know someone on the gun control or gun rights side because I don't. I think there's two things. One is that I don't. Um, I, I think that 
populations and publics decide for themselves what kind of society they want to live in. Um, and so I think, for example, in the U.S., um, there's a debate, you know, that, that whether or not we should be armed. But by virtue of our laws, we've basically already made that decision. And as you know, there's hundreds of millions of guns that are not just going to go away, um, regardless of what the how the law would be changed. I don't I don't think that's pra pragmatic um, or politically feasible. Um, but the other thing that I also go back to is that, you know, there's this kind of kind of like what you said, like, oh, you know, this happened in Canada and then suddenly all these gun regulations are put into place. This happened in Australia or England or, um, you know, New Zealand. And then suddenly the law was fundamentally changed. And, you know, there, there's two pieces of that. One is, you know, most people say, OK, that, that why couldn't that ever happen in the U.S.? But there's also the issue of if that did happen in the U.S., it would it would have a much different effect than it would have have in a place like Canada or like um, Australia or like New Zealand. Yeah, it's an apples and oranges um, kind of comparison. Yeah, and and the the reason I say that is, um, and this is like one of my pet peeves, is that you know in the U.S., oftentimes we have this line of like we don't have gun control, and that's actually not true. <laughs> and the reason it's not true is that we just call our gun control something else, which is tough on crime laws. So if we look at, um, you know, mandatory minimum sentencing, if we look at the, you know, use a gun and you're done law in California, if we look at our, the Armed, criminal, uh, Armed Career Criminal Act, um, which is a federal law, um, we actually criminalize, we aggressively criminalize um, gun possession for certain people. And it's, it's very racially disparate how we do that. Um, and so we can, you know, I, I think that the, the racial politics of, I mean, we can even see it in terms of what kind of gun crime we we talk about on a on the national level so you know we have this huge politicization of active shootings especially in the aftermath of, of parkland um but one one thing that those parkland students realize and and actually um you know dave cullen uh his new book Parkland just came out and what he really chronicles is, you know, these, the, the students in Parkland were like, we need to find other kids who have also been affected by gun violence. They go to Chicago, they meet these, you know, activists that have been, you know, really doing this work for years. They, um, you know, go around and they, they are trying to get, you know, the public, the media to listen to like, Hey, this is not just about us in, you know, suburban Florida, but this is a big problem, right. you know, addressing, you know, affecting kids all over the U S and all different different kinds of circumstances and the and and you know continually they're frustrated by the fact that the media will not hear that message um so i think that's really um you know a lot of the gun policies that we debate are not debated to fix fundamentally the problem of gun violence in the u.s they're debated to fix certain gun problems that we want to fix so like we even you know banning assault weapons um that's not the majority of gun violence in the U.S. Um, and the most gun deaths are actually suicides. They're not homicides. So um, I think that I so so again, to go back then to this thing of like, well, New Zealand did it. So why can't we do it? Um, even if we could do it, it wouldn't have the same effects. And I think that that is a huge um I mean, it's it's not in a way it's kind of like, OK, well, we're not we're not going there anyway. But um, it's something to really keep in mind as the terrain shifts. And, you know, as as some, you know, many people believe that Parkland did really fundamentally reconfigure what what is possible in terms of gun policy in the U.S. Yeah, I, I agree that I think that there are a great deal of nuances that would have to be considered. And you can't just make an apples to apples comparison to a place like Canada or New Zealand or any of the Nordic regions because they their culture is vastly different. And I think what you were kind of hint, maybe hinting at was a lot of times that this could create a black market too, like with assault rifles and getting rid of mm -hmm. assault rifles. And um, sometimes I, I personally wonder if it might may just be more of, a, of an issue of, you know, looking at something as simple as, I always go back to, you know, you have to be trained, permitted and licensed to drive a car so, you know, it seems like sometimes a commonsensical thing might be that the same sort of, uh, you know, strict restri uh, restrictions maybe should be placed on gun ownership. You know, they both have the potential to be extremely dangerous. So they, you know, I don't, I, I guess I don't see why they're, they're not looked at in the same way. Um, but I don't know, like uh, this, the woman that you had mentioned previously that that uh, had the fascination with the Columbine shooter, she uh, mm -hmm. she she went through all the legal motions to get a gun, and yeah. so it makes you wonder, you know, because she yeah. she was being tracked well, by the FBI at the same time, so yeah. it's it's a it's a strange thing that she got away with that. 
Yeah, but that's also something that I think, you know, again, like there's a tendency to be like, well, we passed the law, so everything's fine. And what, what, I mean, if I could just, what my stance on the NRA is that whether you love what they do, hate what they do, they, they are very, very good at what they do and should be studied for that purpose. Um, and so, you know, the NRA is always thinking of the long game. Um, the background check debate, you know, it's often a, it's, it's been so focused on closing the gun show loophole, you know, closing, closing loopholes, making it, you know, making a universal background check system. Um, but there are a lot of inconsistencies in terms of like whether states, whether states are populating mental health data, whether they're populating it federally or just at, at a state database, um, whether they are required and within what amount of time they're required to actually put mental health data in there, whether it's retroactive that they're going to put that mental health data in the database. Um, there's a lot of sort of devils in the details with background checks. Um, and some of it comes down to, um, so I did research actually in um, Metro Detroit on, on like actually watching gun licensing processes. So how do people actually get vetted for a concealed pistol license? And it was it was shocking to me how um, I just and, and, you know, by virtue of just, you know, this is Detroit, but also Detroit trying to talk to who knows how many other jurisdictions, um, just how poorly maintained slash poorly coordinated um, these these databases are that are supposed to vet people. Um, and so I, that's also something that like, you know, even California, who has a armed, armed and prohibited persons system, which is supposed to basically um, uh, basically identify people who owned a firearm and then did something that made them prohibited. So uh, were committed uh, to a mental health facility, had a disqualifying or had a disqualifying misdemeanor or a felony. Um, and even that, I mean, you know, there was a at one point a few years ago, it was like, oh, this costs a lot more money than we thought it would. And it's it's basically not functioning <laughs> very well because of that. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reality of implementing a lot of this stuff. And this is actually why my research now that I'm looking at is actually on, on law enforcement and what they think about gun policy, because that's the last little twist is that a lot of gun, and we see this in Colorado right now that, you know, you have Colorado sheriffs saying, I'm not enforcing, um, I believe it's the bump stock ban. They're like, I'm not, I'm not enforcing it. Um, this, like a lot of law enforcement are, are, are not willing or not, a, you know, enthusiastically on board, I would, I guess I could say, uh, in, um, in enforcing each and every gun law. And that's something that I don't think has been fully appreciated either. So the last thing that I want to bring up yeah. and uh, Sorry. no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so much. No, it's, it's a huge topic. There's so much to talk about, but, um, you had, uh, just a moment ago kind of touched on, on the mental health aspect of this. And I think that that's, something that we're also very lacking in the u.s is 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 paying attention to mental health issues and providing as much help as possible to to people that are suffering from that and, and not letting people fall through the cracks um yeah, yeah. do you think that that is something if if we had more mechanisms in place to address these issues and and relieve the stigmas of mental health uh do you think that that would be something that would would be a remedy to this situation yeah, I, I think, you know, it's unfortunate. So I think it's it's a good thing that we talk about mental health. Um, but it is unfortunate that the way that this debate has been constructed is such that it's really become mental health is a... Kind of a platitude. You know, yeah, it's a platitude. Well, it's a platitude, but it's um, so on the one hand, it's a way of saying, um, you know, these these active shooters who were, you know, we all thought were good kids from good homes and good neighborhoods, that they're not actually they're not an evil thug like the real criminals, but um, you know, they just have mental health issues. So there's like a very troublesome sort of class and race uh, thing going on in terms of how we use that to describe certain, um, certain gun offenders and not others. Um, but then there's also the problem that like, we're basically, we're not actually talking about mental health services. Usually once, especially once this gets to lawmakers, we're basically talking about this as a way to identify people as, as risky individuals and, and funnel them into to risk categories, right. To say like, you can't own a gun. You can't, you know, we need to have a database to know that you're dangerous. Um, if you look at what 
what's been what's been passed. There's a lot le- there's a lot of enthusiasm for databases, and there's n- much less, less enthusiasm for actually funding mental health supports. Um, and that's what we should right, be talking yeah. about. Because, but I think that goes back to what you brought up at the beginning of this conversation, which is that we we think in a fear based mode, and so we don't think how can we help people reach their po- fullest potential. We think how can we how can we, you know, hunker down and 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 try and protect ourselves from these from these impending threats? Because who knows what will happen if if we don't track people who potentially have mental health problems, right? And so I think if we started from the perspective of like how do we how do we help every support people and help everyone reach their full potential versus how do we just protect ourselves? Um, then the conversation about mental health would could be a great one. Um, but you know, I think. Every time that the two sides of the gun debate agree on something is a time to set back and say, why are we, what's actually underlying this agreement is, are we actually solving the problem or are we kind of going back to the, you know, what we agree we can be afraid of. And I think that's the case with how we often talk about mental health. And it's also the case on how we talk about, um, you know, man, it's tough on crime gun laws that, um, you know, stigmatize that, that are really kind of geared at sort of these, you know, racialized tropes of gangbangers and drug dealers. And so, yeah, across the political spectrum, those are the two things we can agree on. And I think that's, that's where we need to sit back and ask why, why is it that's what we are agreeing on? Not just celebrate, oh my gosh, there's a compromise. Finally, let's pass a law because we can. Um, Every law that can be passed is not necessarily a law that should be passed. Um, So that's, (laughs) that's my, I I guess my final statement on on gun policy. Yeah. Well, it, it sort of just further isolates those people that are, were already very isolated because it, it sort of just like separates them from us and says that these are the people that you need to be afraid of and uh, doesn't really address the, the core of the issue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. that yeah. that's great. Um, I really appreciate your time, Professor Carlson. Um, is there any anything Thank else you. that yeah. you want to leave us with where we can find the work that you've done? And Yeah, so I teach at the University of Arizona. I teach a class on guns in America, which I absolutely love because I get students from all sides of the political debate and we have a civil conversation and um that's that is my passion is actually talking across the divide on this issue um and um yeah so you can find all my work through uh the faculty my faculty website at the university of arizona excellent all right well thank you very much again awesome thank you all right.